Happy Comic Con weekend, party people! Welcome to yeah. Yeah. Cinema Royale. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah, up, I'm Travis Hobson. That's John Nolan. We are Punch Drunk Critics, coming at you from DC. Uh, talking movies is our thing. Uh, yeah, this is Comic Con weekend, but I mean, you would barely know it. I mean, yeah. I, uh, yesterday, I posted an article. Uh, I can't remember who wrote it. Um, it's about saying a prayer for Comic Con or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think Comic Con is dead. Is there any way it comes back? I mean, what are your? Well, so there's a world where it comes back to its roots, but the truth is, as popular as comic books are, it's not about the books. Very the same amount of people. It, the comic book movies haven't really exploded comic book reading. So even if it goes back to its roots of the books, it's it's not really going to help it. And you've got DC, Marvel, and Disney. And somebody else I'm forgetting. DC, Marvel, and Disney, three of the biggest draws for the last 20 years, um, all have their own deal now. So Yeah, that's the problem. Um, I think the last, because it's the second year in a row that Comic-Con has done their Comic-Con at home virtual thing. Right. And in a couple months, we'll have DC Fandom doing their second virtual event. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Warner Brothers really nailed it last year with DC Fandom. Uh, which was which had breaking news and trailers and all sorts of stuff, and they did it virtually, and it kind of it really did kind of feel like you were at Comic Con at home. Yeah, uh, I mean it's really what it felt like, and I, don't, I hate as someone who's been to Comic Con, I think what ten years in a row or something like that. I love going to Comic Con; it's my my favorite week of the year, other than Sundance. I absolutely love it. Uh, I like going there for that, um, mm -hmm. but I don't feel like it's ever going to re rebound the way it used to be uh marvel can always do d23 if they want to with disney uh they can always do their stuff at other events around the country like they've done or some places or even around the world there's that brazilian con that they drop a lot of info at all the time mm -hmm. um they do they don't need to do comic con and they've been kind of pulling away from it bit by bit over the last few years anyway and Warner Brothers, like I said, they now have DC fandom. They can put on a virtual event on par with Comic Con without risking their talent, uh, without having to, to pay, you know, exorbitant fees to stay out there in San Diego and rent space and do all sorts of crap. Uh, I don't know if Comic Con rebounds the way it used to be. I think there'll still be stuff that goes there, TV shows, probably a lot of streaming. They'll probably fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll probably see a lot of that. Actually. A lot of streaming shows fill in the gaps where, where big Marvel and Warner Brothers stuff used to be. Uh, but will it be the same? Well, even I want to go there if it's, you know, if it's if it's changed significantly. It, it, look, it, our friend Julian thinks it'll go, go back to being about comics. I don't think that's true. Um, I don't think that's the case. It won't go back to being like comics because they wouldn't need that big ass space, which is which is bought and paid for for years. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't need that big ass space just to sell comics. Okay, so that's never going to happen. Uh, that space is going to be filled by TV shows and streaming shows and other movies. Um, it, it, it'll, it's always going to be a multimedia thing from here on out. And right. One thing, comics and, and, multi, and other forms of media are inextricably linked at this point. Um, so that's always going to be the case. But yeah. I mean, that no. drawing power. You don't have Fox dropping X-Men stuff there anymore either. You know, it, all these things are consolidated now as well. It's really tough. Sony yeah. is as much in bed with Marvel as anything else now, too. So, I mean, they'll probably have stuff there on their own, but not as much as they might have. It's just so much, man. So, That's so what you got to remember when you think, you know, when you say DC, Disney, and Marvel, and you're like, you know, that doesn't really, I mean, Disney and Marvel, same thing. But, you know, you think that can't be everything. But then you got to remember the um, the buyouts. You know, Fox, like you mentioned, is uh, is under there. There's so many places that are under those three tenants. But, um Disney you know, very rarely does Star Wars stuff there. Yeah, it's, it's almost never there. I mean, um, that's been you know. I mean, you have you have its own thing for that. You have Celebration, which we didn't miss. Star Wars Celebration, which has been going on for they, years. They have no reason to bring that stuff to Comic Con anymore. Yeah. So I mean, there's there's really it it stinks because it's it's not much different than the streaming wars where, you know, it was awesome when uh, Netflix got huge and you had one place you could stream all the stuff, but now. You have to go to 12 different places to get what you used to be able to get in one place. And it's going to be the same thing with cons. Um, I will say, you know, we are we have a local con here that's 
really, I, I'm still blown away by how much it's blown up over the last five years. Awesome Con, which is happening next month. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you said you were going to be there covering it a little bit. I'm planning on attending, uh, probably just as a guest, but we'll see. Um, I talk back to the critics panel what's going on there again. Okay, so you're actually going to be appearing um, in a panel. So you guys get your tickets for Awesome Con now. Check out Travis in that panel. But, I mean, they, if, if celebrities are your thing, which is, you know, a lot of the reason that people go, I, it's one of the reasons I've always lo loved horror conventions. Like, you go to them, and, you know, when I started interviewing, you know, quote-unquote celebrities, I'd interview, like, Oscar-winning directors, and it just wouldn't have the same punch as if I talked to Dolph Lundgren or somebody that was huge in my childhood. Uh, and that's what these cons were always good for on the celebrity sighting side of things. Uh, well, Weathers is going to be an awesome, awesome con this year. I really want to try and talk to him. Car Weathers is. Um, that. That's not the one I was most, I was most excited about that until I saw that they actually got not just Christopher Lloyd, but Michael J. Fox is appearing as well. Yeah, so Marty and Doc, stuff. I don't know how. Awesome Con has done an awesome job of, uh, uh, in their name, uh, yeah. of getting people, of getting stars to be there. I mean, I'm, I'm excited to see some of those folks. I very rarely do interviews in Awesome Con, though. I've, I've done maybe a couple. Mm -hmm. But now they've gotten such much bigger stars than back then when I was doing interviews over there. So yeah. um, I really want to try and get Carl Weathers, especially since I do that real action uh, video series. And, mm -hmm. and Action Jackson is one of the most popular ones that I've put up. That would be cool, yeah. I mean, they used to be a, a great place. I mean, one of our first breakout interviews was at a con, and um, you know, but now it's become such a business, and we could probably do an entire show just on cons. Um, but you know, in, in like two thousand, like after Comic Con started really blowing up in the mid two thousands, then you started having a lot of small horror conventions and sci fi conventions were the big ones. But a lot of these small, and you'd see the same people at them all the time. And then word started getting out; these guys are getting half. If you're at the top of your game. Like uh, Norman Reedus, for instance, when he goes out for Walking Dead for signing it at these cons, he's making five hundred grand in a weekend. Um, so it's it's just gotten kind of uh, ridiculous. And, and the the prices go up so high. I remember we went to we were gonna go to the Supernatural convention. As much as fans as we are of that, and I know our good friend May uh, did do this. It was like three hundred dollars to get an uh, autograph and a picture with the two leads. And I'm like. That's just, you know, that seems extort extortive, um, if you ask me. But anyway, Awesome Con coming up in a month. Travis is going to be there on a panel. Lots of cool guests, lots of cool stuff to see. A uh, chance to get back to some normalcy. Um, as long as, just be careful going out, guys. We know the Delta variants out there. We'll Wear see. your mask. I, I, the way numbers are going up in Virginia and D.C. again, I don't know. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, it, 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 it's, you know, we all feel like I saw a very depressing um, meme the other day. I was like, don't worry, we're not going to go back to, um, to, to lockdown. We're just going to normalize dying from COVID like we normalize dying from poverty and cancer and everything else. So uh, that's a bit scary. Anyway, we're not here for depressing hour. Um, we had, you know, speaking of Comic Cons, a, a movie that would have been huge at Comic Con this year. Uh, that came out this this week that I have had some real reservations about. Snake Eyes has always been my favorite Joe, um, and you gotta you gotta remember that he's a lot of people's favorite GI Joe character, having no personality, no really look. He just okay. wears all black. Yeah. To... He had a personality. No no dialogue, nothing to say. Let's say that I, his personality is is badass. You know he's a ninja. Um, you know, and he did, you know what, honestly, he always did convey quite a bit of personality of caring, um, what's the word I'm about, caring, he's a, um, he's very, he's the most, for obvious reasons, since he doesn't speak, he's the most enigmatic of all the Joes, and yeah, that's like, like your, your, your classic Wolverine, he, that is why a lot of people like him, mm -hmm. um, I also relate that to the fact that both characters were, their entire histories were largely written by Larry Hama. Larry mm -hmm. Hama, who wrote Wolverine and Snake Eyes through almost the entirety of the 80s and into the 90s. Um, and his background is Asian American and uh, in, in the military. And you would see both of these characters, um, their backstories largely contain Japanese uh, stories about code, codes of honor, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you like Snake Eyes and you like Wolverine, it's probably for a reason. Uh, I'm one of those people that grew up during that time, too, reading Larry Hama's stories for both. So I like both characters quite a bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm, I'm right there with you. And there's there's a lot of influence of Larry Hama's stories in this G.I. Joe, uh, Snake Eyes Origins movie. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think there's also some stuff in there that traditional fans of the character are like, 
what? You can but give simple fact like, that he doesn't have a mask on the but whole I'm time. Also which... like, you should have known going in exactly that you weren't getting your traditional snake eyes as soon as they cast Henry Golding. Yeah, not with him, not with uh, you know <laughs> Captain Handsome uh, Henry Golding in the lead. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so let's talk about uh, Snake Eyes. Um, uh, directed by Robert Swank, stars Henry Golding as Snake Eyes. Um, Snake Eyes is not my favorite Joe. My favorite Joes to, are like Roadblock and Beachhead. Uh, I would have guessed Scarlet. <laughs> I am a fan of Scarlet as well. Scarlet plays a role in this movie too, played by Samara Weaving. Uh, a little disappointing in her. A little disappointed in her character in this mm. uh, because she's introduced at one point. And then kind of vanishes for about an hour, and then comes back at the end. <laughs> comes back right at the end. Uh, but the story is is, is largely familiar. Uh, you see his origin as a kid. See his father uh, killed. Uh, Snake Eyes then goes off. It's a large gap in his story that I think is waiting to be filled in in sequels. I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, you see him twenty years later. Uh, he's uh, working as a, a fishmonger basically, but really he's smuggling weapons for a for a for a yakuza dude named kenta um who promises to help him find the people who murdered his father uh he also befriends tommy a, a rakshagi um of that clan the rakshagi clan um it's a rakshagi but i've never been able to say it right uh, yeah nobody can <laughs> uh and he saves tommy's life and so tommy brings him back home to join the clan to be his right hand man uh, for whenever he becomes the, the heir of the clan. Mm -hmm. um, and the Rashikagi are altruistic ninja clan. Like, they're not like the Yakuza or something like that. Like, the Yakuza right. are their rivals. Um, and basically, Snake Eyes has to endure three labors uh, to prove himself worthy of the clan. Uh, but there's a deeper story going on here because Snake Eyes has vengeance in his heart, which is something that he can't, can't really have going in there. And it also... Uh, causes his loyalties to be sort of blurry throughout the movie. Um, I'll say right off the bat what I really liked about this movie, the things I really liked about it, and there, and there are a lot of things I do like. Uh, I think the action is actually really good in this. Um, it was shot really well. Um, Robert Swank is not somebody I, I necessarily think of when I think of the action filmmakers. Yeah, he did Red, but I thought that Red's action was pretty generic, which, as it should be, considering the cast is a bunch of people over 60 and 70 years old, yeah. Um, uh, but he also did like two Divergent movies, so you got to remember that as well. Which I also didn't think the action was great. I was gonna say I don't even remember anything about those movies. Yeah, I know. Uh, so uh, Robert Swank's not someone I think of, but I think the fight choreography is actually really good in this, partially because you've got Iko Uwe in there playing the the hard master, and his scenes are fucking brilliant, as you would expect from the guy who led the raid. Um, but also, I think Andrew Koji, who plays Storm Shadow Tommy, is actually really good. He's actually the one that I think is the most charismatic personality on screen, which is funny because the movie's called Snake Eyes, and mm -hmm. I, was, I found myself more uh, related, relatable uh, with, uh, with Storm Shadow, with Tommy, because Tommy, I think, is the one who kind of gets screwed over in this whole deal for much of the movie. Um to the point where he has this sort of character turn at the very end of the movie that doesn't feel genuine to me. Um, whereas Snake Eyes, for the most part, he's dubious the entire time. And I'm like, why are you guys liking him so much? He's <laughs> he's skulking around the, 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 the headquarters the entire time, getting caught all the time. Uh, his motives are clearly cloudy. And yet it's Tommy who kind of takes the back seat. In the comics, this is not exactly the same, but there is that sort of thing where Tommy gets slighted by the Arashikagi, and so you can see from his perspective why he would be upset, why he would have hatred for the clan, and why he would have hatred for Storm Shadow and for Snake Eyes. In this movie, I think it's a lot more distinct. Like, I'm like, Tommy really gets fucked over here. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to see more of his story, then I wanted to see more Snake Eyes. And that's a bad thing when the movie's called Snake Eyes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing with, you know, in, in my memory, um, in, in, in all the movies up to this point, Snake Eyes is always somebody that did, um, you know, bad things, quote-unquote, before he joined the Arashikagi. Um, and, like, you know, he was caught 
stealing food. That's how he got in there, and you know the different origin stories. But I did feel like he didn't his nobility, like the noble heart that makes Snake Eyes who he is, wasn't really shown that well. I did as good as the action was, and as fun as it was to see, you know, because I can let go of things like, oh, he doesn't wear his mask all the time, whatever, it, you know. It, it, you gotta you gotta make your peace with that fairly early on. If you don't, yeah. If you don't, then you're gonna hate it. You're gonna hate that he talks a lot. You're gonna hate that you see his face. I mean, but because think about how it, how annoying it. would a movie be that that stayed true to Snake Eyes? You know, you right. that that bit only works as a side character. Snake Eyes, the, you've got two of them already in the last decade, so enjoy yeah. those. Yeah. Uh, but, well, and uh, <laughs> speaking of those, I found. Do you think this movie would have been better with Justin Lin directing it? I just I kept thinking of his his fight scenes and ret- retaliation, and while they did take some wire foo and like that fight on the John side Chu. of the mountain, John Chu. What did I say? Justin Lin. Yeah. Oh. Um. So John Chu. I'm sorry. Um. So with John Chu in there, you know the the fights were really there. I mean, I do think Ego Ways is a bit of a upgrade on Hardmaster from Riza. Maybe, um, you know, the martial arts a little bit more believable. Just a little, just a little, just a little bit, just a little bit. But um, you know, I I really I dug getting into the to the lore behind the clan. I almost wish it would have been a little bit more of that. Um, it, the story didn't seem. I, I mean, I'm with you. What you're saying is, it's like it didn't seem balanced to to really establish Snake Eyes as a hero and Storm Shadow as an antihero. He shouldn't go villain because he's never been a real villain. Villain. He's an antihero. Um, and I, I thought we'd get a little further into the Joe of it all, um, but I'm glad you know, you, you didn't go too far into the GI Joe aspect. I didn't want to go too far into it, but you know, a little bit. I mean, they went they went more into they introduced more of Cobra than they did of, of GI Joe. Obviously, Baroness plays a big role in the movie, um, but um, oh, you know what? Rizzo was blind master, wasn't he? He wasn't hard master. Yeah, he was. Blind. That's right. That's right. That's I mean, right. It doesn't matter. Peter Mintz is an upgrade over him too. Yeah, and, uh, and, I, and look, and I like Rizza as Blind Master just fine. It just didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's, it's, I like both masters honestly. I, I like most of the stuff they do with the Arashikagi. I mean, I thought except for the trials themselves, other than the one with Iko Uwe, which I thought was brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and those it's pretty easy to figure out what he needed to do in that case. But it's just Ego's uh, attitude during it was just great. And, of course, yeah. when he gets a fight all to himself, it's the best fight scene in the movie. Um, but uh, but I, the stuff that I didn't like about the Arashikagi labors, I, I don't like – I don't think it's smart to introduce the aspects of G.I. Joe that I always thought were sketchy, like the, the silly – like the, the giant serpents in this thing. You know that can like that are like telepathic or something. Or, the serpentor or, or, of it all. Or empathic. <laughs> I don't. I never thought that kind of stuff when it was introduced in GI Joe. I never thought that stuff was really very good. Yeah. It never made any sense. And they had like co- people like Cobra Law and things like that. And it's like really, you know, this stuff doesn't doesn't and, fit GI Joe. They they don't need it. GI Joe never needed it. The military stuff was always more than enough. I never understand why they did it other than to sell toys. Um, yeah, as silly as it sounds, G.I. Joe's always been the more grounded, the better. I mean, grounded for G.I. Joe. I mean, like, even I the cartoon Serpentor, series. But Serpentor doesn't make sense. And this yeah. kind of thing that they were trying to do here, where they were trying to, like, it, it seems like they're, like, in further movies, they would introduce more of that stuff. And I think that's a mistake. Yeah. I mean, just establishing the Irish Chicago and ninjas in general as a non superhuman but superhuman performing group of, of warriors is all you needed. And, and establishing Storm Shadow and Snake, Snake Eyes as brothers at war from time to time as the top of that order is all you really needed to do. Um, that being said, you know, it sounds like I'm shitting on it, but I, I would like to see more G.I. Joe. I, I really think they, they got the short end of the stick with Retaliation was really a fun movie. It was a lot of fun. I mean... I somewhat liked Rise of Cobra, but they, they kind of lost the whole um, idea behind what G.I. Joe was. Yeah, I, honestly, I oh, remember stairs, almost nothing about the Rise of Cobra. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I remember Channing Tatum was in it. I remember Rachel, Rachel Nichols was um, was awesome. Um, and there were some great scenes, but it's like they tried wasn't to update Sienna all the Miller, looks and everything. Wasn't Sienna Miller Baroness? She was, and she was a great Baroness. Not even like from a ma- uh, masochistic, misogynistic point of view but she was she really looked the point and she she played it well but they really lost me when they put on the super suits i didn't mind ursula corbero in this she was fine she was good yeah Uh, yeah, but i just thought sienna miller was great well i liked it yeah Uh, 
I, I love the style of it though. I mean, it kind of feels like a pulpy '80s style martial arts movie in some aspects. The way it was shot is a really heavy leaning into the Japanese culture aspect of it. And the way it's shot, mm-hmm. the credit and credit sequence really delves into the culture a little bit. Uh, the look and feel of it, I, I, it feels like a Shaw Brothers thing at times. They, they're really getting involved in that aspect of it, and I think that's probably because future movies won't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so they're really deep, digging deep into it. It felt like, at times, kind of like the Wolverine, um, which, I, like I said, I, like I talked about earlier, the Larry Hama connection. Larry Hama gave his stamp of approval for this movie, I hear. Mm-hmm. Um uh, those characters are very, very inter- closely intertwined in terms of uh, their their backstories, so it makes sense for it to kind of mimic a certain style. Um, but yeah, overall, I, I, I do like this movie. I mean, I don't think it's great. I think I rated it three out of five with a despair. Yeah, uh, I want to see more. Uh, I do, I do hope that they, I, I do hope that Henry Golding brings a little bit more to the table. He's not bad. But like I said, he's kind of overshadowed by Andrew Koji, who I think is better, mm-hmm. uh, who has more presence than him, uh, and the writing favors Tommy as well. Yeah, it really seemed like it was more Storm Shadow than Snake Eyes. I mean, that's just if you sum it all up. Um, which, you know, I my my main curiosity. Obviously, there's a mid credit scene um, that kind of sets up some future stuff, but. My main curiosity is how they go forward. Is is there a G.I. Joe team movie? Or are they going to handle this like Marvel? Are they taking a, a, a chip from Marvel where it's going to be G.I. Joe Origins Duke, G.I. Joe Origins Storm Shadow? And, well, I guess yeah. they did Storm Shadow. I but. mean, we know that they want to do another G.I. Joe team movie. And it seems like this movie is trying to introduce that to some degree. But um, I don't know. I don't know if they do another straight snake eyes. Considering how it did at the box office this week, we might not see another one at all. Uh, and only made thirteen million dollars. Yeah, uh, and so it might not do anything. Uh, it might not do any more. Um, I'm interested to see if that shakes it's anybody. Actually, look, maybe it's just a GI Joe brand. Maybe there's just no interest in it. Could be. I mean, at some point, maybe we have to re- we have to consider that GI Joe Retaliation had tons of star power, and it did fine, but it didn't break out or anything like that. Yeah. Maybe no interest for G.I. Joe the way there's interest for Transformers. And these two are sort of, you know, cousins in a sense. Um, yeah. It's, it's I mean, I feel like the, the marketing for this wasn't amazing either. Um, I mean, because the G.I. Joe movie I could see failing. I mean, we got, you know, we're pulling out of Afghanistan finally after 20 years. Military stuff is, you know, not on the top of it. And, and it's a different world where, you know, we don't have kids watching this stuff as much, you know. They have plenty of violent cartoons and things, but it's not the same as it used to be where you have cartoons like this that everybody's watching. Uh, even, you know, one of the things we talk about today, Masters of the Universe, which is a, a little bit darker is not the really word, but, you know, he actually uses his sword in that in that adult. show. More adult, yeah. Um, you know, so. Samara, yeah. even though I want to see her really, really get her chance. She seems to be one of these, um, who's a guy that's an avatar? Sam Worthington types. That just picks Don't say that. That's, picks mediocre after mediocre role. I mean, that is not, that is not fair. That's not fair. <laughs> She's better than Sam Worthington. Sam Worthington is good. Sam he just Wor- picks Sam horrible Wor- th- things. Sam Worthington only has Avatar to his credit, and he's no one thinks of Sam Worthington when they think of Avatar. No. no Samara Weaving has movies that people associate with her, right? You got like the Babysitter. Her. You got Ready or Not. Like ready or not, like you instantly think Samara Weaving, uh, and she has things that are that are that people know her for. Nobody knows Sam Worthington for anything other than the fact that he's he's backseat to, to to visual effects in almost every movie he's in. I mean, I just uh, I, I think we know her very well. We know Ready or Not. We know cool. the Babysitter, but you know, she's 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 great in almost everything she's in. She's she's, she's fine in this too. Yeah, she's just, she's just, she didn't have enough, Scarlett doesn't have enough to do in this. And, I guess we shouldn't be totally surprised. It's not her movie, um, and she's a supporting player in someone else's movies. But it is cool that they they are setting up, you know, because in the in the the books is a, Scarlet and Snake Eyes were a sometime thing. So, um, you know, but that's uh, thirty minutes on on Snake Eyes in a packed week. I guess we can probably move on. Um, another movie that uh, 
you know, nobody was really. I, I don't know where, where. How do we feel about M Night Shyamalan as a, as, like a, as a people? As a people, like, are are we are we still ready to give him another chance? Are we still happy with him, or I, is he I, still I, in jail? I am sick to death of the of the M Night Shyamalan is back type <laughs> comment because he's never gonna really gone away, and he and his bad movies st- still are nowhere close the number of good movies that he has. Yeah. It's just that his first few movies are so beloved by people or they're fan favorites for people. Like I don't think I don't know if Unbreakable is necessarily beloved, but it's a fan favorite amongst amongst particularly uh, uh, geeks like us and you know fanboys because it's like yeah. the, it's like the it's like if you wanted to point to uh, like the like the uh, the way to do a superhero movie for adults, Unbreakable would be it. Yeah. So people love that movie for that reason. Of course, it then spawned sequels that we didn't even know were coming. Um, and that was probably one of the coolest moves of his was bringing in Split and not having any indication that it was a sequel. But then he didn't he didn't stick the landing with Glass and pissed everybody off there. Yeah, Glass didn't really didn't really pay off the way it should have. But mm-hmm. but it was still an uh, ambitious uh, ambitious effort on his part. I think for the most part, his movies are really great. It's just he had he established this gimmick and everybody sort of. When the gimmick started having less and less payoff, people took that out on Sean Sean Lon in, in I think unfair ways. That mm-hmm. doesn't mean he had all great movies in that time. Obviously, The Last Airbender is shit. Um, After Earth is shit. Um, these are movies that are shit. Uh, but these are all. But the, you notice those two movies I named for you are like mercenary gigs. They're not like M Night Shyamalan creations. Or anything right like yeah yeah they're, they're directing uh, jobs right and it's not like and of course it's not he's not perfect in that regard either the happening is, sh- is shit mm. and lady in the water is shit so I mean, he's got his fair share of, of garbage movies but i think his the good stuff far outweighs the bad uh six cents unbreakable um uh, uh village uh, see, I, I, that's what I was waiting for you to bring up. The Village, I always remember liking it, and I know people will always signs. cite that as his first bad one. You know, Six Sense, Signs, signs Unbreakable. Um, yeah, you know. I know. See, I think that's unfair. I mean, I, I think The Village is great. It's just that the, that was the first one where people were like, boo to the payoff. Because like, his... Boo. And I was like, the payoff was fine to me. But he's, okay. he's got the most unlucky... Um, trademark of any director in the world, and that's that the twist ending. I mean, Hitchcock is probably the only other person that's expected to have some, and you can't land a twist ending if everybody's expecting you to have a twist ending. Six Sense like worked that. because nobody was expecting it. People are like that with old now, also. They don't mm-hmm. think the payoff was big enough. I was like, What are you expecting? I mean, I don't know what you're expecting, but it's so it's always because the 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 path to getting there is always so good that mm-hmm. you want the ending to be on that level, and it's just it's almost impossible to land that all the time you're not going to yeah. get the six cents ending every single time folks it's just not going to happen um well or- and it's unfortunate because he as a filmmaker he's really good i mean he, he makes good great looking movies he knows how to um to to go to suspense throughout the films he knows how to frame things it's his his pacing is it's is always very good which is one of those really geeky things, but is extremely important because, you know, I call it the butt numb, numb uh, meter. You know, if you're ready to get up and go to the bathroom, then you got a director with bad pacing. Yeah. So mm-hmm. we'll talk about Old, which is his latest film. Um, <clears throat> and this one, I, I love the premise of this movie, and I love the way he, he plays it out. So you basically have a bunch of people of various backgrounds uh, on an isolated beach or on vacation. Um, and on this beach, it somehow causes them to rapidly age mm-hmm. uh, and there's no escape there's no way out and of course this causes all sorts of conflicts within the group um, as they try to figure out what is happening to them uh, and, and the way it plays out to me I think is perfect um, he seems to have figured out almost every detail like what would happen to like uh, he talks about he has people getting injured and the rapid cell acceleration and things like mm-hmm. that I love the kind of clashing of personalities. Um, he's he's kind of telling children's stories. He does it all the time in his movies. So these are basically children's stories in a lot of ways that are that are geared uh, in a darker sense. Uh, and that's kind of what this one is, kind of dealing with uh, the way we examine our lives, living life to the fullest, and what ha- and our and the way we relate to death. Like, what do you do when death is 
staring you in the face. Right. Um, these are all these sorts of themes that he's dealing with throughout the movie, and I think he does it in really suspenseful fashion. And I was happy about the fact that I had no earthly idea how it was going to turn out. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what was what was happening. Uh, I had no idea who was causing it, and I had no idea whether anybody would ever survive it. Um, and I think that's a credit to him. Uh, I think in terms of the way this one is shot, some of it is, is may not be the strongest from the way it's shot in some cases. Uh, he goes a little bit over the top in a couple of shots, uh, or at least his cinematographer does. Uh, he didn't shot more than shoot so many. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, but I but I was really in I was really into this, and it helped that he had a fantastic cast as well. Uh, Eliza Scanlon, and of course Thomas and Harcourt McKenzie, and uh, Diego Luna, and Vicky Crepes, who I Gail absolutely... Garcia Ber Bernal. Was it Gail Garcia? It was Gail Garcia Bernal. I was mm -hmm. getting him and Diego Luna mixed up. Um, That's all right. I get I get uh, John Chu and um and Justin Lin mixed up apparently. It's the Ethu Mama Tambien thing. <laughs> I always get the actors from that mixed up. Yeah. Uh, and top to bottom, Rufus Sewell. I mean, really great cast all, all along this thing. Yeah. Uh, I enjoyed this. I mean, I, I kind of want to go see it again if I'm honest, just to see things that I'm, details that I might have missed. Um, because I know there's a lot of mystery and a lot of clues that are dropped throughout it that I probably wasn't paying attention to. Um, because there's so much other stuff going on in the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I was digging this. Not yeah, quite, but I was digging it. I mean, it's it's definitely not in my mind. His one of his top three. You know, no. No. it does it doesn't get in on Six Sense, Signs, and Unbreakable. But um, it's it's pretty up there after that. Um, I was surprised to find out. You know, I'm always reading uh, reading IMDb trivia after something, and this is uh, based on a Swiss graphic novel called Sandcastle. Um, yeah. It made me think. Like I always thought of him as like a very original filmmaker, like almost Kevin Smith like. And I'm not going to direct any of my own stories. It, his other stuff is this the first time he's done something like that, or is his is Sixth well, Sense and all that is based on something else as well? This is the rare film from him that isn't set in Philadelphia. That's mm. one thing. He almost always does his films in Philadelphia. Yeah. But yeah, this one feels sort of free for him, and it's uh, it's interesting. It's it is a, a change of pace. Um. Mm. Yeah, he's delved into sort of fantasy before, but this one just feels different. It feels looser, um, which I, I really like. In his movies, he exerts so much control over his films. They're all very deliberate in a lot of ways. There's a lot of planning going into them, you know? Yeah. They feel sort of deliberate at times. This one feels feels a little bit looser to me, which I think is a, is a benefit. I'd like to see more of him doing stuff like this, actually. It could be because of the ensemble nature of it. Everybody's sort of close, closed in together, mm -hmm. um, playing off one another in ways that his other movies don't because they're very narrative heavy. Because um, he's always dropping signposts throughout his movies to where they're headed. This right. one doesn't feel that way. So yeah, I, I, I'm with you on that. I, I do feel the sort of same way. Yeah, and it's it's um you know his movies you, sometimes you have to look but they always have something to say and and this you know I I'm I'm hesitant to even start uh, down this road because um, the last thing you want to do is spoil an M Night movie but um you know they, they, it's got something to say and, and the ending is one of those things that you're sad to realize you could see actually happening if you know the science around it was possible but um yeah I'm I'm not gonna go any further because I'll I'll slip up and say something but I think we're both on board with old um you know definitely like you said um he, he he gets a he gets an unfair shake in hollywood with m night's back or m night's down again or whatever but you know it, even his it, it, other than lady in the water which i think is his probably his worst movie i think and or no i'm sorry the happening the happening and lady in the water were huge missteps but other than that i think um what no the trees are killing us uh, well, Mark Wahlberg's classic performance. The is really bad. In that yeah, movie. yeah. Um, the script is really bad in that too. So, but this is this is uh, run of the mill Shyamalan, which you know honestly, run of the mill sounds bad, but that's good for a guy like him, I think. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, one movie that we, uh, I, or not we, obviously, you know pretty much about everything that's coming out. I. I missed some things. Um, Jolt uh, with Kate Beckinsale. We actually, not because Jolt was coming out, but just by happenstance, have been rewatching all of the Underworld movies lately. And man, they are silly, but they are fun. Um, her overuse I really of want to the. Rewatch them. Actually, I have the entire. They just released a box set with all five Underworld movies, or they're about to. 
Really? They're sending it to me, and I kind of, I'm kind of anxious to watch them actually. I'm gonna need to put it pre order because they every single one of them is is available on on one streaming service or another, except for Blood Wars. I think it's called Blood something. Blood Wars is pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, so Angela it's just pretty just bad around Rise of the Lichens. Like yeah. you don't. <laughs> yeah, a- Angela like just the first one that she she skipped out on. Uh, yeah. Came back, I think, for the, the last two, maybe. I think something like that. I don't know. Well, I, you know, I had forgotten, and honestly, I'll be 100%, I don't even think I watched all of them, if I'm being serious, because we were talking about, um, we were watching last night, the third one, and I don't remember humanity finding out about the vampire, so I think I checked out at some point, and either don't remember or anything like that, but Jolt, um, you got Kate Beckinsale, Jai Courtney, Stanley you watch, Tucci. You watch Jolt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, 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 I love Kate Beckinsale. I'm oh, still, yeah, I, you know doing action again it's been a long time since she has yeah she's she is um, so very that, that's why I was about it. she's she's got a um a very strange combination where she is delicately beautiful like classically beautiful and delicate but she can convincingly kick ass a lot of times I believe her like when you see her in like the last days of disco like you remember that mm-hmm. movie mm-hmm. it's hard to imagine her becoming celine at any point yeah and it's hard to imagine her from Celine becoming who she is now. I mean, she's she's just a, she's one of the more credible uh, female action heroes, action actors out there. Um, I don't know if she ever gets if she gets enough credit for it. Um, maybe it's because she doesn't do them as much. She really never get branched out to do it outside of Underworld that much. Other yeah. Than, other than this, and I always would kind of wish she would do more. Well, maybe it's just me, but I always think when I think female action stars you know our modern day cynthia rothrocks it's it's mila jovovich and kate beckinsale are the are the top tiers um but i mean that's just based off both of them having a a really big franchise behind them uh mila not she julie, really not julie not, not charlie's her own charlie's but Char, charlie's does it and does it well and she's up there for sure but she's got such a a She's so good, such a good actress, and that she gets these highly credible, like, awards level roles that kind of, you know, it's 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 like when um, I don't even want to say Mel Gibson. No, I so I don't put her in the action star realm. I put I do put them in there, but this is is definitely uh, a weird movie on par with something like Crank. It's not like Crank, but just the, the storyline. Basically, she's a woman with a disorder that causes, um, you know, basically. Uh, uninterrupted rage fits and she wears a um an electric vest to control it and uh it's about uh that and and her wanting to be with jai courtney for some reason um and <laughs> okay. i mean her character okay her hair her character has this uncontrollable rage thing that's what i said uh, and which has made it impossible for her to have regular relationships because she'll beat the fuck out of him and, and kill him uh, which she'll do to anybody who pisses her off, whether they're guilty or innocent, as we mm-hmm. see her do to a, an annoying waitress who probably did not deserve what she got. Um, but, uh, but basically, she meets the perfect man, played by Jay Courtney, who basically is perfect because he's charming and he doesn't leave. All right? mm-hmm. So uh, they have a wild night of passion, and then she wakes up and finds out that he's been murdered, um, which, hey, she just found the guy who might be the perfect man for her, and now he's dead. She's pissed off, and people got to pay. You know how uh, I feel about Jai Courtney, and I've told you how I feel about Kate Beckinsale. So I didn't really care when he died. <laughs> <laughs> he did not care when Boomerang died. All right. Well, well, no, you know, it wasn't so bad because one of the things that's really tainted my view of Kate Beckinsale is that whole um, Pete. Um, what was his name? What's his name? Pete. Uh, Pete Davidson? Pete Davidson thing. Like, they were a thing for a while, and I'm pretty sure he's half dead, at least. Or he has jaundice at the minimum. Um, and that really... Pete was, Davidson keep pulling... He pulls dimes pulled, out of nowhere. He must yeah. be hung like a Jamaican horse, because... There's something, there's something going on. Or he's like Ben Stiller, where he tells... Like, I used to say, say about Christine Taylor, he must wake up and tell her the funniest joke she's ever heard yeah. like, every day. Well, Pete Davidson just looks like he smells. You know what I mean? Like smells like old weed. Looks like he smells like 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 liquor. Like bong water. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so that's not about the movie, yeah, but he's so probably yeah. just he's probably just super sweet. But mm-hmm. then again, you notice that he never these women never stick around either. So I mean, who knows? Yeah. Uh, but anyway. Uh, but yeah, Kate Kate Beckinsale. So she goes off on, basically on a rampage to find out the man who 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 killed the guy who could have been the one. Mm-hmm. Um, 
The movie is directed by Tanya Wexler. Now, Tanya Wexler, uh, she makes really specific movies about about women taking on, you know, male society. And there's a lot of toxic masculinity in this movie that Kate Beckinsale's character gets to lash out against. Uh, so Wexler's first film was uh, Hysteria, which was about the invention of the vibrator. Um, which I mean, considering I'm a child, <laughs> considering the electric device that she uses to to tame herself in this, you can kind of see the connection there. Mm-hmm. Uh, her second movie was Buffaloed, with a uh, with uh, show favorite Zoe Deutsch, mm-hmm. uh, in which she plays uh, a woman who lives, lives in Buffalo who becomes uh, a debt collector, taking on an all basically all male uh, 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 profession there as well. Um, so, and then in this one, of course, Kate Beckinsale's character is a woman who literally clicks out her rage anytime she feels like it. Mm-hmm. Um, and Wexler's movies are always really sarcastic and snarky, and this one kind of is too. And I don't know if it necessarily works in this one because uh, the problem with this movie is that, to me, it doesn't go far enough. Like, I think it should be crazier. Um, because Wexler is kind of known for this crank junior style, um, but the script does not elevate the way that it probably should. Now, the thing about the crank movies is that they were steadily getting more insane, more insane, more insane along the way. Mm-hmm. This movie falls into a really bland pattern, like right in the middle, and it gets kind of boring. And it does not keep peaking and peaking and peaking the way it should by the time it gets to the end i really didn't care all that much um the snarkiness doesn't help either um i think if you're going to mix the snarkiness with the craziness that's one thing that works but when it flattens out and it's still kind of snarky i don't know then it just kind of pisses me off um so yeah i wasn't feeling this the way that i wanted to because i was super hyped for this movie mm-hmm. um but it, it i ended up not liking it the way i wanted to if i'm honest <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I I was you know pleasantly surprised by everything in it. I mean, I thought the action was a ton of fun. Um, it was very it's it, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, the only thing I had a problem with is in movies like this, if you can make a sequel out of it, cool. If if it's warranted, you know, like we it, mentioned, it's Crank. Really set it up. And and that's the problem. It seemed like there was too much. You hate to say too much world building or too much, you know, detail, but there's there's so many threads that are put together going out there that it almost seems like it doesn't belong in this film. It seems like, like what you do for an MCU movie or something like that, but not for something like this. They it should have like focused. Set up some sort of Avengers thing with her or something. Yeah, and I'm I mean, like, I don't want to see that kind of sequel out of this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's like you know, focus on on what you got and finish it out. And this can this is one of the the negative. Um, uh, the negative aspects of that is when you do that, you're taking time away from the story you're trying to tell at the moment. Um, but I, you know, we also haven't seen Kate Beckinsale in an underworld movie in some some time, and really an action. I, I, mean, I could be wrong on that. Maybe she has been, but I couldn't remember the last action movie she did. Um, but you know, and honestly, I think it was an underworld movie. Yeah, so that would have been. I mean, I could be completely wrong and say ten years ago, but uh, you know, who knows. I think it was um, that. Was that? Yeah, not 2015, maybe? Because they started in 2003, and there were only, they weren't like the Resident Evils where there were 14 of them. Um, the recent one was Blood Wars in 2016. That was okay. the last one. Yeah, and just, you know what's surprising is that she, I didn't realize how little she'd been acting during that time. I mean, she's only got. One of them is a video game, so we won't count that one, two. She's only got three um, credits until then. Uh, A show called The Widow, which I remember seeing, but I never watched. Farming. She did The Only Living Boy in New York. Yeah. So she really hasn't done much of anything uh, recently. Um, You know, she is almost 50 years old, if you can believe that. Um, Really? She's 48, yeah. Whoa. Yeah, she's 48 years old. I say that, I say that, like, and like, Hey, Travis, you're almost 50 if you don't watch out. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, but neither you or I looks as good as Kate Beckinsale ever has. I mean, and she's, she's oh. very, you know, we always, I, well, not we, I always take it to, to a sexist place, but it, I mean it in the best way possible. I, I, I saw, um, what was the movie she was, right now. 
Just let it lay. She was in with Claire Danes um, when they were in a prison. Um, she's available now too, by the way. She she was with Michael Sheen. I remember that. Mm-hmm. And she was married to Lynn Weissman. Lynn Weissman, the guy who directed most of those underworld movies. Yep. Uh, <laughs> they they divorced three years after the last one, mm-hmm. which. It's funny that she says she if they were six movies she wouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if it's because her husband is the one directing all of them. <laughs> that would do it. Um, but you know she she actually you know they say age she's like a fine there. wine. Not with Pete Davis anymore. She's out there if you want to make your play. I, she you know she called and I, I you know told her Kate again I'm married. If oh, you would have caught called me an, called an Angela answered. You, you know it, 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 if you. <laughs> If you had not gone with Len, <laughs> called me instead, we'd be all right. But I'm married now, and I have children, and I'm a happy man. So leave me alone. Um, that was probably an issue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But no, I mean, she's she's surprisingly good still in these roles. I mean, and it is – she's the Paul Rudd of, of, of actresses because it is exceedingly hard to believe that she is almost 50 years old. Uh, but 50 is a new 20, apparently, uh, according to this. Um, Look a day over 30. Honestly. Yeah. We are um, we are going yeah, way long on a lot of this stuff. Yeah, we're probably not going to get um, to the this week, which is unfortunate because there was some good stuff. But um, Yeah. Um, we can talk real quick. I, do, I don't want to skip Motu. Um, so we can just talk yeah. real quickly yeah. about that. Uh, the uh, Kevin Smith-led Masters of the Universe Revelation dropped on Friday. Um, you've got a... Um, uh, a review up for it, right on punchdrunkcritics.com, which we have not no. said at all this I episode. Did not, I did not review that. Um, I did get. Ooh, hello, I'm frozen. You are. Oh, you're. I, I see your name now. Uh oh. I'm gone. Did my camera? Yeah, my camera died on me again. Uh, I don't know why that keeps happening. Not for nothing, but that second. I mean, the resolution on the first camera is good, but this angle is probably better. I'm gonna kind of see more of you. Yeah, but I don't like it. Um, <laughs> but I don't know why my my new camera sometimes conks out. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, obviously it reverts to the to the old camera. This happened like right at the beginning of an interview the other day, and it pissed me off. Of course. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, since since you put it out there, uh, I know we've been dropping interviews left and right while you fix your camera. I'll run run down everybody on this. Um, there's been a ton of interviews, uh, lately, uh, we've been kicking those in overdrive, so make sure you check out Punch Drunk Critics, there we go, we're back, punchdrunkcritics.com, we have interviews for Settlers, How It Ends, Joe Bell, First Date, The Tomorrow War still, if you're catching up with that, Zola, they're just a ton of interviews that are being done by the crew here at Punch Drunk Critics, so check those out, um, there's plenty of John Nolan interviews, man, can't seem to get them. Yeah, um, there's plenty of Comic-Con news as well, um, you know, so I, I did do a little kind of mini review in my cover coverage of the Masters Universe panel from Comic Con this year, but um, I, you know, I, I know there was a lot of the usual trash talk from uh, the toxic uh, masculinity or whatever you call them, the same people that are voting down things like Birds of Prey, that Kevin Smith was going to make something that was way too woke, and uh, He Man wasn't even the hero; it was Tila that was a hero, and. I actually thought it was it was very well balanced. I mean, obviously there's a there's a pretty big shock at the end of episode one. Um, yeah. The animation for this is, I, I think I found my one of my favorite animation styles because I've never liked anime style. Um, right. I've always liked traditional two D cel shaded animation. But this kind of finds a balance between the two, uh, and it's just a gorgeous show. Um, yeah, know. I think it was great. I, they sent me screeners of it. I watched a couple episodes. I've really, I, I'll be I'll admit I wasn't really into the first episode until maybe about 15 to 20 minutes in. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, they're taking this thing in a totally different direction. Yeah. And that got me interested. Because um, the thing about He-Man, you know, when I, when, I was, when I was thinking about it and I was watching and I was like, why don't I like this? When I was watching the first episode, I was like, why don't I like this more? And I was thinking, I was like, I don't really understand He-Man. Like I watched all those. I watched every episode of the cartoon back in the day. I watched it every day after mm-hmm. school, like everyone else. Yeah. But I don't understand He Man. Like I don't. Like there's like it's kind of swords and sorcery, but there's also like te- lasers and stuff. And yeah, it's know, a I don't, mix. I don't, I, don't, I don't. I don't understand his power. Like, is he Hulk power? Is he Superman power? Or is mm-hmm. he just like a really strong dude? 
Like, right. I didn't understand it. And they were, the, con, the, the cartoon was never really clear about any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, it was always whatever was needed for the moment was what we would do. And, and I, I think com, coming into this, I was like, oh, I still don't really get He-Man. Like, I remember having the toys and watching the cartoon and liking it. But I wasn't really too discerning back mm-hmm. then either. So I was like, this doesn't make any sense to me. And I, I needed them to kind of set some standards for what these characters are and what this what Eternia is. Like, what is happening? And by the end of the first episode, I kind of had a clear idea. Yeah. This was, like, He-Man can, can punch the goddamn ground and cause a goddamn earthquake. I was like, okay, so he's super fucking strong then. Like, he's not just a... He's not just a dude who spends a lot of time at the gym. Okay. Yeah, he's All Superman right. without flight, basically. You know, so I, and they, they, they established some rules that I think help a great deal. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that really helped for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's always been, uh, there's been a, a big, it's been very compelling for me. Th- uh, Thundercats was the same way, where it mixes sword and sorcery with future tech, um, where you have things like flying cars, but you also have a guy in a loincloth. Um, and I think done right, that can be really cool. They did do quite a bit to, they treat, they, it seemed like they treated it seriously. Um, you know, for all the love we have for the eighties cartoons, truth is 90% of them were, were 30 minute commercials. They were trying to sell toys. They did the bare minimum usually to get them there. And what, you know, they were lucky enough to have something that kids latched onto, but now, and that's why a lot of these eighties remakes and, and redos could be worthwhile because you can give it the story and the care and the love that they didn't get originally um i mean the, the character designs for he-man were always top notch for me uh you know from Stinkor to uh triclops i mean i thought all the look of everything was great and and didn't the, it feel the, like at the beginning though that they were just kind of throwing people at you yeah yeah it was like a roll call it was, it was like, it, yeah beast man triclops and like all these people were just showing up and you're like well what is happening like they're just showing up for this fight and i'm mm-hmm. like i don't even know what they're fighting over i don't know what's going on and i never yeah. really understood that about he man he was like what is that guy they fighting over like i don't really understand like is it <laughs> yeah well that becomes like, clear in this as like, well I like, thankfully people, i was like do people die in this he man world like what's going on yeah like you never really see people get killed and they're, they're fighting with swords and shit and yeah. there was like there's one moment where he man actually tries to like stab the skeletor he runs him through like, and he's like you finally used that sword the way it's supposed to be used. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, that's, and that's, you know, the eighties were a weird time because you had, you had a lot of basically R rated films adapted into cartoons like Rambo and RoboCop. I mean, RoboCop was rated X when it first came out. And there's still an X rated version out there for its hyper violence. Um, and he man and GI Joe, you had all of these. Yeah, I was but say, we had GI Joe where people shot at each other all the time, and they never would kill anyone. You, you, the and the the, the, the jet would get shot and explode up, and then out of the flame would come the guy with the parachute yeah, every single time. People on the ground, they would shoot. The, they would shoot the guns out of each other's hands, like in the middle of the battlefield. You're like, mm-hmm. who's that good of a shot? But um, yeah. but there there were a couple scenes in GI Joe where and I was sitting next to our friend Julian, and I joked with him. I was like, a lot of bullets flying around here and nobody getting killed it's almost like they're paying homage to the cartoon right he's like he's like yup you got it yeah well that's that's why cobra was was all um their infantry was all those robot dudes because you could just mow them down but um master of the universe was uh was a welcome surprise for me i, I it's it's really good and i can't wait to see part two so that's good um, man glad you liked it so much i really want to try and finish watching this one yeah. um yeah i really do so we'll see what happens so, like we mentioned, uh, there's plenty of news out there. I know uh, we're we're running short on time. We've only got about six minutes, but there's two things I think we definitely have to address, and that's uh, you know Is that their all the reviews. Yeah. Well, we had uh, Joe Bell. If you wanted to talk about that, and Settlers. I mean, did you watch Joe Bell? I didn't see Joe Bell or Settlers. Okay. Well, I will just recommend people go to our website and check out our, my review of Joe Bell, which is the Mark Wahlberg um, film uh, about. Um, Jaden Bell, uh, the, the eighteen who was murdered in twenty, uh, who committed suicide in twenty thirteen, and his father goes on a cross country journey to talk about uh, anti bullying. Uh, so it's a, it's a it's a good film. I have some issues with it in terms of emotional man- manipulation stuff, mm-hmm. but uh, it's still it's still good. And my interview with Reed Miller is up on the site as well. And Settlers, which is I think is maybe the best movie of the week. Uh, Sophia Butella, Brooklyn Prince, Johnny Lee Miller. 
Um, really great film, tense sci-fi film from uh, uh, debuting director Wyatt Rockefeller. It's kind of a chamber drama. It's a really enclosed sort of thriller. It's really fantastic. Uh, you can check out my interview with him on the site as well. So, yeah. All right, all right let's go. News. Awesome. So, uh, just the DC news, I think, is what's the most compelling this week. We've got a uh, we've got a Batgirl in the books, and we've got more information about Michael B. Jordan's uh, quote unquote Black Superman project. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Leslie Grace is going to play Batgirl uh, in the the movie that's coming up from the uh, Bad Boys for Life directors. Um, Leslie Grace is the was in just in in the Heights. Mm-hmm. Um, sort of her breakout role. She's also got a few Latin Grammy. Uh, Grant Grammy nominations. She's multi talented. I'm really excited to see that because, hey, it suggests I mean, obviously, it doesn't suggest, but we're going to have a non white Batgirl, which is very interesting. Um, I'm sure there will be some, some outrage about that, but whatever, who cares? Fuck those people. I mean, um, Jeffrey Wright is, is Gordon, right? He's Gordon over in on The Batman, Matt Reeves' film. Yeah. But I'm curious whether or not, whether or not this movie is going to connect to that. Or if it's going to be part of the DCEU with, you know. Well, not that they have to match up like this, but Leslie Grace um, looks like she could be Jeffrey Wright's daughter, so. I know, but we don't have any information on what mm-hmm. it's So, what, what, it, could be, it, could be, it could be connected to nothing. It yeah. could be off on its own. We just have no idea. Um, but I like that move, though. I, I, could, I would have selected uh, either Haley Lou Richardson or Zoe Deutsch. Those two were also in the, in the mix for it. But Leslie Grace is a good pick, too. Yeah, I like um, her. Yeah, I like her <laughs> her um, and Melissa Barrera. By the way, uh, speaking of Into the Heights, I looked into uh, Melissa Barrera. I'd, I hadn't seen in anything else. Um, and then I looked uh, in her filmography. I started watching uh, a certain show she does. She is not the good girl that she is in Into the Heights. She's got some saucy stuff going on. <laughs> anyway. Um, um, yeah, this uh, Superman project from Michael B. Jordan. He's been attached to a Superman project for a few years now. Um, but now it seems that he's doing his own, uh, black Superman project. It's going to be on HBO max. Uh, and this is separate from what JJ Abrams and Ta-Nehisi Coates are doing. These are two Mm -hmm. totally separate things. Now it seems that at one point, Michael B. Jordan was going to be working with Abrams on that project, but there was some sort of creative falling out. So now Jordan is doing his own thing. That's going to be completely separate. And he's going to be, his film is going to be about, uh, uh, Jesus Christ, I can't remember the guy's name. Valzad. Valzad, who was the Earth 2 Superman. Um, so, yeah, whose, whose planet was basically, Kryptonians are basically wiped out by Darkseid. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's going to be playing that Superman, whereas the Coates Abrams one is reimagining a black Clark, Clark Kent. So these are two totally different things. Uh, I'm excited for both. I'm also skeptical of both. Because two black Superman projects in fairly close order, I don't know. We'll see. Like, yeah. Where does this leave Henry Cavill Superman? We still don't know what's happening with that, whether he's gone or staying. Are you going to tell me there's going to be two Superman projects, but neither one of them is going to be in the DCEU at all? Really? Well, I mean, there's so much uncertainty. I mean, you, like we mentioned the Batman. We don't know where that's going to go. We're not sure what's going on with the DC. And then we have Flashpoint coming up, which is going to blow everything up. But, yeah. I mean, I think I really wish they would have not had those creative differences because I would have loved to see Michael B. Jordan as the African-American, or African Kryptonian, I guess, Clark, Clark Kent. Because, the, and we talked about this before, that's really the more compelling story to me because Superman, Clark Kent, was always a product of his environment and how he was raised and everything like that. Um, you know, he had to hold himself back from bullies in school, sure, but being a white kid in Idaho or, or you know, sorry, Smallville, um, you know, growing up on a farm, you, you're going to get bullied, but it's not that serious. Being a, a, a black kid growing up in that same area and the, the kind of shit you'd have to deal with, the restraint you'd have to show, uh, knowing that you're basically a god among men, and, and you know, that's... To me, that's extremely compelling. Like showing the restraint, it makes him so much more of a no- noble being, and how they would handle that. Or does he not grow up in small anymore? Does he? But grow I'm up? also excited to see who else they get to play this Clark Kent, though. Well, I think Michael B. Jordan is so good, though. But I mean, there's it's it's oh, yeah. not like there's it's not like there's only one African American actor in Hollywood, so. Right, and those scenes you were talking about, the growing up scenes, 
he wouldn't play those teams. Sure enough. That. Sure enough. So, um, yeah, I'm very, I'm curious about both. Like I said, I'm also skeptical. I'm, I'm skeptical that both happen. So. I mean, how sure are we on either? Uh, I mean, this one is we're developing. Sure. We're, pretty so. sure, we're pretty sure on both that both are in development. We're, mm. But we're sure on both. But oh, I mean, as far as actually getting to getting getting to to a place where we can see them. Um, I, well, see, the thing is, I don't think you. I mean, neither one of them is, is like going to happen in the next month or even probably right, next year. right, right. But um, but there, we don't bring in Tanahasi Coast and JJ Abrams to have a project that doesn't happen, and you don't sure really enough. bring in Michael B. Jordan and offering and offer him a series because this is a series, not a movie. Um, mm. or a mini series, not a movie. Um, you don't really offer him that kind of project either, specific to HBO Max without the plan for it to happen. So I'm pretty sure both of these will happen. I'm just curious how how they're gonna be treated. So we'll see. We'll yeah, see. I, I almost need to put one of those to have both of those and then not have a traditional Superman out there as well that's gonna be part of the DCU. That just doesn't make sense to me. So Yeah. I mean yeah, and, and... You know, whatever. I know Henry Cavill is happy with The Witcher, but he he was just such a good traditional Superman to, in my mind. I mean, it, he was he was awesome. Yeah, but on, on top of that, you know, you know, I almost need one of those conspiracy, you know, in movies of the 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 whiteboard with all the things in the in the the uh, threads going from thing to thing for conspiracy guys. I almost need one of those to understand the DCU because the other thing we've got coming up next month uh, that I'm a huge fan of is Titans. You got the Titans and Doom Patrol. Um, yeah, have you you haven't watched any of it? Nope. It it'll take an episode or two to get in, but uh, but I would definitely you know stick it out. It's it's really good. Um, I like it a lot at least. I mean, but, they're showing those episodes on TV on TNT now. Like they're promoting it like it's just starting. Are uh, they really? Wow. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, I, I kind of want to watch it, but we'll see. Well, make sure you guys check out the website. Uh, like Travis mentioned, we are posting interviews and reviews. Uh, I mean, obviously, we're posting those every week, but we've got tons of interviews up right now. Uh, right there on the screen, you can see www.punchdrunkcritics.com. All the news from San Diego Comic-Con at home this year. Um, and hopefully... My list, my list of three that includes Ted Lasso, Orphan Black, and now Titans. There you go. Ted Lasso, I need to get on to. I keep hearing so much good stuff oh, about that. Right. Um, I think I'm hearing about Ted Lasso. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you uh, if you don't want to check the site every five seconds, we got a shortcut for you. Uh, just just uh, follow us on Twitter at PDC Movies. You'll get alerts when every article goes up. Well, Travis is at Punchy Critic, and I am at Punch Drunk John. Uh, again, the site at PDC Movies uh, on Twitch. Travis is at Cinematic Underscore Enforcer. Uh, and if you guys have anything for us, tips, questions, you want to see if you can write some, some stuff for us, whatever. Info at PunchDrunkCritics.com. We're always happy to hear from you. Um, we got to talk a little bit about video games next week. We haven't been talking about it much lately, and I'm I'm so we deep into talk days about going on. our Twitch thing, but we don't want to do that during the show. We'll talk about it yeah. uh, sometime after. So yeah, we'll talk about that week. All right. Uh, until next week, guys. I'm John. I'm Travis, and we're out of here. Thanks for checking yeah. out the show. If you like what we're laying down, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest stuff. Thanks for checking out the show. If you.